All right. You'll miss um, one of the best panels in this conference, so uh, you think again if you want to leave the hall. <laughs> All right. So I'm uh, moderating quite a few discussions. Um, it's part of my job. And uh, one of my wildest dreams is that um, the participants have more questions than I. And um, in my, let's say, seven, eight year career, I, did, I didn't experience that. And uh, always when I start a panel, I, you know, keeping my finger crossed that this will be the panel when you'll have the more, more questions than I do. So I hope uh, you prepared a lot of questions and that my dream will com come true today. All right, so uh, for the start, uh, maybe just a quick introduction of my speaker, so just a, a few words about everybody. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Evolmut from Sopresso. Uh, this is my third venture. Hope this one will be successful. Uh, we've been running uh, renewable energy, like solar panel implementing company, and uh, digital marketing agency so far. Sopresso is an interactive presentation platform. It converts the audience uh, role at the conference at the presentation from the one-way information receiver to a contributor. So like con converting attendees to uh, contributors of the event. Okay, um, maybe just a quick question because before we move to you. Um, why, why did your last startup did not succeed as well as maybe you expected? Uh, the uh, last was, wasn't a startup, it, it was a service-based company. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly our biggest uh, client uh, go bankrupt and we went with them. So All right. it, it was, we were the part of the domino effect. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ivo? Hi, I'm Ivo. Uh, I wear several hats. Uh, I'm basically, not, my day job is I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I have a small software and services company in Zagreb with a couple of friends um, where I'm a board member. Um, I'm also uh, in Zip, which is up there on the, on the screen. Uh, Zip is a uh, startup program called an incubator or accelerator in Zagreb. Uh, up and running for two years now and we're just launching our crowd investing campaign to raise 50K, 70k euros tomorrow. So go to our website and uh, anything from 100 uh, great GB pounds to up to you know, whatever you want to invest into the best Croatian teams. So that's a shameless plug. And I'm also, uh, aside from all that, uh, last year with a couple of friends, uh, the most well-known of which is Robin Wouters, uh, started a new um, European online technology publication called tech.eu. Uh, which is now trying to cover um, the most interesting technology stories throughout Europe, um, including obviously the Southeast European region. So I've been talking to, um, to entrepreneurs that I know here from the Slovenian uh, ecosystem, but any of you that feel you have an interesting story or that you'd like to highlight or comment on something that's happening in Slovenia or in any of your ecosystems and, and environments, please feel free to walk up during lunch because after lunch I'm gone, but you can always find me online as well. Cool, thank you. Igor. Hi, my name is Igor, and I'm here today to actually uh, share our experience how uh, one flop, building one product can, uh, can get you to another product that has a potential for success. And we are, what we are actually doing right now is uh, Google for Business Contacts, and it's taking off. So that's our short story. Cool. Okay, we know Rob, um, so uh, we'll skip y your uh, introduction because um, uh, we already know pretty much everything about you, but um, uh, I'll ask you a, a few questions later. But uh, b because the, the, the theme of this conference is uh, roller coaster, so ups and downs, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, you, Igor, and your interesting story. So tell us about uh, your, this, uh, you, you call it flop, right? Yeah. Uh, and how this flop, what was it? And um, how did um, lead you to this uh, Google Analytics for Business Contacts, right? Yeah. Yeah, so please. Actually, we were doing, uh, two years ago, we started doing uh, cloud software for optimi optimizing uh, businesses in hotels. And uh, where we actually f uh, failed, we did not understand the market correctly. We tried to uh, sell them 
uh, through the internet, and this is just not the right channel where people from hospitality industry actually buy. And the reason that it took us uh, two years to actually, uh, to actually fail, we didn't spend enough time with our customers. So trying to reach customers around the world, we, try, uh, we started to build uh, uh, another pro product actually for ourselves to actually kind of uh, automate uh, getting leads, you know, because we were doing it manually on Google and if I was motivated, I could get like 10 leads per hour. Then I hired some students and in the end I hired some Pakistanis and Indians on freelancer.com and that was a disaster. So we built our own product to actually, you know, kind of a smart search engine to actually get the, a lot of leads in a very short time. And then I had a kind of a presentation in Technology Park in Ljubljana and uh, some other companies uh, came to us and said, okay, we want to use this tool. So, okay, then I started to think, uh, maybe we have a potential here, so we built the first product and a second version of the product. Actually, now we're building the fourth product and we are uh, expanding to Switzerland. Okay. But why, why, why didn't you, you are, I, I pretty much know you and you know, I, I'm now, I know that you are familiar with all this um, customer discovery, validation and all these processes. So um, why didn't you talk with customers on the right way? What, 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 what mistakes would you outline? What was the biggest mistake that you didn't understand customers? You spent time, you, you were in hotels, you talk with them, you talk with managers. So what went wrong? What went wrong? Um, well, the biggest mistake was we didn't spend enough time. Because uh, well, how much time did you spend? I spent about, let's say, 50% of my time. That was not enough. Uh, we had a talk with Blash Kos because we were in Geek House and uh, he told me if you don't spend at least 90% of your time with your customers, you're not spending enough time. So this was uh, one of the most important uh, lessons, uh, lessons learned. And the second le lesson uh, learned is uh, how deep is your market? Uh, how many failures, uh, how many uh, actually, how many mistakes can you make? Because uh, in hospitality business, you don't have thousands of, uh, thousands of hotels uh, in your vicinity to actually you know, uh, make a low cost uh, customer discovery. So when you're actually failing uh, and doing mistakes, uh, if you have like 50 uh, hotels that, that you're ready to, to sell and you make a mistake with 30 of them, you lost a big part of your market. So what we have right now, only in Slovenia, we have like uh, 200,000 potential customers. If I screw up 1,000 of them, I didn't do a lot of, mis uh, a lot of damage, mm -hmm. you know? So these are the, the two most important uh, lessons learned. Cool. Um, Rob, how would you comment this? Um, is this like a common mistake? Um, you know, you have a limited number of customers uh, you, you cannot screw up with. And how do you approach this problem if you have like a business to business? Um, and yeah, what, what, it, what would be your advice? Um, in every kind of big sales or investor meeting, like the big important meetings, right? If you're selling something big, um, it never happens because of one person. And this, I think your point's totally correct. Um, and I'm taking it in a slightly different direction. But when you're going to someone, like when we were going to say uh, MTV, you're selling and there's all these people in the room and there's this VP and that VP and this creative and this person and you're going, you're like, oh, this is crazy. At some point, the, the conversation changes in, in an important way where one person sort of comes around to your side of the table and now they're arguing for you to the rest of their team. So they've sort of stopped being the person you're pitching to and now they're fighting for you internally. They're your evangelist, they're, they're with you. Um, and in some cases, you can find that person a bit earlier before you actually start these formal meetings. Um, and it comes, they're helping you out, they're a friend, they're on your side. If you have that person, it's like you kind of can't screw it up, but you can't always get this person. So my approach has been to find these few, um, like Steve Blank calls them the early evangelists, but just these people who are really on your side, and then you do all the stupid stuff with them, and they're very forgiving, and they give you the benefit of the doubt, and mm -hmm. it doesn't risk, like, because yeah, if you go into a fancy pitch meeting, or like a big formal presentation, and it's not what they want, yeah, it's really hard to recover that. Thank you. Mali, how much time do you spend with your customers? Can you uh, just uh, turn Sorry. on the mic? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we spend around 50% of the time with the, uh, our customers, me personally. So that's why I'm a regular meetup goer and I go to places where presenters and speakers are practicing. 
and uh, try to get into their head. We wasn't really successful with it. Unfortunately, we, I read uh, Rob's book a bit late, so I made all the possible mistakes, what he was uh, addressing in his previous speech. Uh, the really hard thing to do is uh, and, and, uh, to, to seize uh, what really motivates people. And uh, they, they can tell you really beautiful things and, uh, about your product and why they are using it. And then it turns out they are just using it because they think it's cool. And uh, the real value isn't about uh, the things that you are giving to them ju just because it's new and shiny. Uh, and uh, these are the hard things that you learn in, in the process. And I, I think that currently we have a stable customer base who we can, whose uh, information is really valuable for us in terms of directions we are currently developing. But getting to this point is a really rules right. So we screwed up really at least fifth five or seven times when like uh, our program crashed in front of the audience over 200 and like the you, you won't get that speaker to use your product another time mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these are the things that moves you moves uh, your product closer to your market but uh, I, I think if I, I can give you uh, anybody an advice Yes, it's really crucial to talk to them before you start uh, to develop either. So we, we uh, made like 30 customer interviews before we started developing, but uh, they were like kind of useless in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And people who like, uh, okay, by the time it gets out, I will be the most uh, evangelistic user of this product, never used it again. And they start to not return your emails and stuff like this. But uh, thankfully, we managed to find uh, these evangelists from all around the world. So, so did you manage to develop this um, you know, bullshit detector of who will be your uh, paying customers and who will never reply to your emails? Uh, uh, no. No. As, as we are a freemium product, uh, we try to speak to everybody who uses our product in front of an audience, and we can see it from the database that how many people connected to a given session, and we reach out to every, each and every one of them, still today, uh, and we are planning to do it in the long run, because uh, presenting is a really cultural thing, and um, other uh, the things work in the US, like in, in our region, and uh, for uh, something that we even know, don't know the, the real cause of it, that why are we so successful and in South America, namely in Brazil, like uh, more than half of our users from Brazil. So that, that's something we are trying to uh, investigate, why, why they are the, the users. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Ivo, maybe can you comment, uh, you know, you're in contact with a lot of startups. What, what would you say, um, how they, you know, are they paying enough attention to this customer discovery process before they actually build a product? And um, wh what would be your comment or advices, observations? Very often not enough, very often. Um, but to put it in perspective, our program, at least, so the, the um, startups that I come into touch with most are really, really super early stage. Um, unfortunately, in, in, in this region, in Croatia, Slovenia, and, and the wider region, there are very, very, very few people building startups for whom this is like the second or the third thing they've done. So they've exited once, twice, and these all often tend to be the most effective founders in, in, in more developed environments. Um, so what we see are, you know, very basic, very typical mistakes of people, you know, they're engineers, they're programmers, you know, we've heard this a thousand times and we try to help them overcome that as, as fast and soon as, as we can. Um, one story that I love is one of our uh, founders, uh, so this is a young lady building a, a cloud-based app for nutritionists. 
So their, her m m first customer base is in the US. Um, the reason I like this project is that many of the startups we see uh, base their ideas on what they see around them. So especially in pitches, competitions, we see a lot of tourist-based startups, a lot of uh, restaurant ordering apps, uh, whatever, things people you know, f see around them as problems. Now, um, uh, Mirna, who's building this uh, Green Pie app, um, started somehow finding, okay, she went through a, a very intensive online uh, startup uh, education program before she even started doing anything. Um, and then she somehow found a way to contact American nutritionists about what they need to be done. Um, and she had like five or 10 of them sign up as kind of, you know, beta customers before she ever started writing or before she hired or worked, started working with a programmer because she's not a programmer to start writing any code. Um, and she's doing fairly well now. She's one of the first, first and so far only team from our program that got a follow on investment. Um, and I really, so for me, you know, this is a really good example of somebody doing something fairly non-intuitive. So going completely outside of her environment, com she, she doesn't have anything to do with nutritionism as per se. She's, she likes to eat healthy, whatever, but that's basically it. Um, so, you know, we always encourage startup founders to, to try and think about customers, not necessarily just the ones that are in their neighborhood, in their vicinity. Um, we had a, um, a startup mentoring program called Startup Camp last year in Rijeka, and it's happening again this year, where again there was yet another bar ordering app. Somebody wanted to order drinks online or the phone, tablet, blah, blah, blah. And myself and my colleagues who are from Zagreb as mentors said, this is so, no, we, we put it nicely, but we said this won't work. We had a mentor from the US who's based in Miami. And he said, oh, this is amazing. You have to bring this to Miami immediately. It's going to work, ba da 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 So for us, it was like, what's going on? So what I'm saying is, you know, what might not work in Zagreb might really take off in Miami or not. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you really, I think, you know, in, in this region, in, in Slovenia and Croatia, I r would really encourage startups to try and kind of step out of the local environment. I mean, building something that works locally is great if you can do it. But maybe you have a great idea that would work much better in London or in Miami or I don't know, somewhere else. Mm, cool. I hope that answers your question. Yes, exactly. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Igor, you also uh, actually did what Ivo said. You were um, trying to market your product, the first product in the US, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. And what was your experience with uh, you know, marketing your product or talking with customers outside to Slovenia? Actually, we found out it was far more easier to talk to Americans to actually to talk to Slovenian and Croatian, uh, Croatians who worked in the hospitality industry. I mean, it was amazing. Um, this is why we have a United States phone number uh, on our web page, uh, in my uh, signature, in email, because we found out that uh, people from the United States are to the point. If you, if, uh, you have a motive to actually uh, make a contact, and the motive is talking business, you're talking business in three seconds. You know, that's the point. Here, even if I want to do a B2B sales of a cloud software, I have to go for a cup of coffee. You know, it's, it's really a cultural thing. And uh, you know, when, when you uh, More than one cup of coffee. Yeah, more than one cup, yeah, more than one cup of coffee. And why is this so disturbing? It's okay in the beginning. There's no economic logic in the beginning because you're discovering the market. But uh, afterwards, when you start making money, you start to think about customer acquisition cost. And all these coffees take me a lot, of, a lot of my time. Instead of writing emails, personalized emails to my potential customers, uh, I'm going for a cup of coffee because people want to meet me. And when they meet me, they say, uh huh, now I know who you are, now I will buy it. You know, and I'm just freaking out. You know, they, really, they, this costs a lot of money. Okay. And it's not obviously good for your stomach, right? So much coffee. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm a coffee drinker, so that's not a problem. But it's really customer acquisition cost is uh, one of the things you he really have to pay attention to. It's okay. one of the, the, the biggest killer things uh, out there for, for, for a young company. Okay. Before we need to uh, move to the next, next theme, um, audience, do you have any questions? All right, all right, Mark and Goran. Perfect. Maybe my dream will come true. Uh, Mike? Um, so, hello. 
let's say you are a startup company from Slovenia uh, in the very early stage and you sell to US. So most startup companies in this stage cannot just go to states and start to talk to customers. So what would be the next best approach? Oh, who yep. you were asking? I think you. For me? Okay. <laughs> Whoever wants uh, or anybody. Actually, uh, the internet has a great potential because uh, without actually getting to the to United States, you can talk to people from the United States. So uh, one of the things we have found out, to, uh, you can buy a United States phone number, and we actually have an area code of 40, uh, 408, so that we give an impression that we are in Silicon Valley. No, yeah, really. It, it costs us 85 euros, and for these 85 euros, you can call for two cents per minute with a potential customer from the United States. So, you know, I mean, it's far cheaper to, uh, than to actually make a phone call uh, here in Slovenia. So just make a, make a page, make a statement, uh, contact the people through LinkedIn. Uh, we are actually uh, sending cold emails to people that didn't opt in in our landing page. Because if you personalize the message and uh, the person has the, uh, has the feeling that the message is really intended uh, for him or her, um, they're just really uh, ready to talk. So our, our experience here is extremely positive. Cool. Mark, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah, would, I would relate to this, this question. I, I think Twitter, uh, as it, it is really underused in Hungary, but it's a gold mine in terms of potential customers. And you can uh, search for people who uh, identify themselves in your niche. So who are uh, sharing content uh, somehow related to the problem you are solving. And uh, you do your research on them. And uh, what we found that it's uh, really useful to put uh, in the beginning of the email something that they said. That as, as uh, I saw your blog post, as I saw you in this YouTube video saying this one, I really, I'm really interested in your opinion. And this is something that uh, tends to be a real ice breaker for, for us at least. So we went from like uh, two to three percent in terms of cold email response rate over 25 percent. But it's not spamming, so you can't do it in bulk. It's a really lot of work to do the research and uh, to personalize those messages. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, Roman. So you, you gave the challenge, right? So I'm <laughs> taking that. <laughs> uh, I have a question for all four of you. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what do you think about the 80, you know, famous Pareto 80-20 rule, right? Like 20% of your customers or whatever give you 80% of revenue. So does this mean that you should focus on those 20% of the customers and spend much more time with them and just ignore the other 80? Or should, you know, like the freemium people say, well, you know, you never know who reads, you know, our replies. So, you know, we really take every customer seriously because maybe at some time later, you know, we're going to get out something out from this or from the other people seeing that we deal with everybody. The, I mean, there's like people come at it from both directions, um, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you've seen, like when Pinterest launched, um, they were another YC company, so we, we got like a little glimpse inside and they didn't know what the tool they were building was for. They didn't know who was going to use it or why anyone would, would want it. They just thought that it was a nice way to look at pictures and they kind of launched with that and then they found that the people who really wanted to use it were wedding planners and designers to, to get inspiration and to show off portfolios. So at that point, they kind of switched their approach. And they spent a ton of time at d design conferences, a ton of time talking to wedding planners to understand that use case um, so that they could really perfect it and take advantage of it. Um, other people start with a very focused idea. Um, certainly, like, you can't meet with everyone. And I, I actually think that spending, like, three months on customer discovery is a huge warning sign to me because ultimately the founder has a ton of stuff they need to be doing, right? Like, you need to be building the product. You need to be, like, building the team. There's a million things to do. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, and I just try to make my life as easy as possible. Like, if I can meet someone at a, at a conference, meet 10 people at an industry event, and I kind of know what I'm trying to ask, then you can go, you know, you can get a month's worth of customer learning in an hour uh, if you're kind of prepared for it right and you ask the questions in the right way. So, yeah, I definitely try to make my life as easy as possible. Thanks. Eva? Um, I think it totally depends on your business. 
So it depends on whether you're B2C, B2B, if you're selling to enterprise, you're selling to small businesses. Um, as an example, I, I once had a, a talk with um, the guys that started SoundCloud and asked them, you know, what's their international expansion strategy and which countries are they looking at next? And they said, we don't have any custom, uh, country expansion strategy, we just go globally. I mean, from their perspective, the whole world is just a single unit. Uh, if you talk to other startups and founders, you know, they think very, very, they do a lot of thinking about their next, their next market. Um, another example, uh, Branko Milutinovic, who is running Nordius, which is one of the you know, hottest gaming, sports gaming startups based out of Belgrade. Um, when I talked to him about the same topic, he said, well, we're going to Japan next. So I asked him, well, what, do you need, what are you doing to prepare for that? He said, well, we have to get inside the Japanese gamers' minds. So, um, <laughs> um, but back to your question, 80-20, um, I'd say just roughly from my experience, if you're doing large-scale enterprise B2B, then yeah, you should be probably really focusing on those customers that are bringing the most revenue and the most value and the most potential. Um, if you're doing, you know, like, like Nordius is doing mass scale gaming where they have, I don't know, 10 million monthly active users or daily, I don't really know what, there's no, I mean, it's a totally different marketing approach, totally different sales approach. So, depends on, what's your, what's your, are you asking about your project? Is there a project you have that you want to think about? Yeah, I think what you really, really need to be careful about, from, at least from, a little bit from my experience, is that uh, you know, there can be customers that are smaller companies that bring you a lot of value and revenue. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be big customers. However, I think that in many cases, and this is not just a case in startups, it's a case with many businesses, um, if you don't watch out and you're not careful managing your time and your people's time, uh, it can end up that people that really don't bring that much value to your business end up spending or wasting a lot of your time. So that's, I think, something that needs to be carefully managed. Okay. Just, I, I think that sorry. it's, uh, it's uh, depends on, on the stage where you want. So uh, when, when you are developing your value proposition and like uh, changing the the product itself while uh, receiving customer feedback, I, I think it's uh, uh, really good to talk with everybody who is interested, and not just uh, to get uh, what they want, but to get the inhibitors, what, what is uh, inhibiting them from using your product, because it's, it's a really hard thing to learn, and uh, people aren't even conscious uh, about their own fears and uh, disablers, and uh, that is something, for example, at, at a B2C situation, you, you have to be really digged into this. So know what is going on in their head when they are deciding that uh, will they use your product in front of 100 people and what are their fears that uh, maybe they aren't consciously expressing to themselves. And I, I think that in the beginning you, you have to talk with more uh, every people who think you can be sometimes a customer or a user. In, in, in our terms it's a different stuff, but in B2B I guess they are both. Okay, thank, thank you for your comments. Um, Jaka Lindic, join us. Um, meanwhile, uh, so uh, welcome to the panel. Um, maybe just for the audience, uh, a quick introduction of um, who you are and what are you doing, so that everybody will know and be on, on the same yeah, page. Yeah. Um, sorry for being late. It's not something that I usually do, um, but it just happened. Um, basically, I'm a professor at, uh, of entrepreneurship at uh, Faculty of Economics. Uh, I was a visiting scholar at Berkeley University. I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, just um, spent three months in the Bay Area, um, entered the market with one product and returned with a completely different one. So, um, yeah, that's something we call pivoting. And that's All right, ex today's subject. Exactly. That, that was my next question. We are moving from um, customer discovery to the um, pivoting um, part of the discussion. So, uh, 
pivoting? What, what was your pivot and um, which were the analytics or data you pivot in on what, what was your, why did you pivot, so? Um, well, as a startup, you're, or with a new project, your only task is to show traction. If you don't have traction, you don't have anything. You could have the best product in the world, in your opinion, but if nobody's using it, you don't have anything. Um, basically, what I learned is, I talked this, I discussed this with Steve Blank, and his comment was, you need 100 interviews, you need 100 people that you really in depth um, discuss this topic, your product, your service that you have. Uh, when I checked my contact list and how many contacts I uh, made and how many interviews and I discovered that uh, I had a little bit more than 90. And in the meantime I discovered that the product that we have, that is by the way successful in Slovenia, um, is pretty much useless for the states. And that was our agenda. We wanted to enter that market, and don't get me wrong, we did market analysis here, but it's something uh, completely different if you talk with your customers or potential customers. We entered with um, educational tablet. We wanted all the kids in Slovenia to use our uh, special, specialized, specially developed Android tablet just for educational market. Uh, one thing that we learned is that it is a nice-to-have product, uh, but not a must-have product. And you, the, the answer that you don't want to hear from your clients or potential clients is, I totally love your idea, I love the product, uh, just I don't have the time now. That means that you will go through the sales cycle again and again and again, if they don't feel the pain, if they don't understand the pain, then you don't have, you actually don't have the product. Okay, what, what were the differences? You said that, uh, it is, that your product is successful in Slovenia. Uh, why isn't successful in the uh, States? What were the differences? What mistakes did you make? What, what wrong presumptions were you? Uh... Well, using tablets in education is something that is a virgin market. Nobody actually knows how to do it. You have Apple that sold it to the biggest um, school district in California. It was $1 billion uh, worth of business and students hacked the system in a week. So Houston, we have a problem. Um, well, they have a problem. I'm happy that we, we were not in that position. It's nice to have a $1 billion business, but not if you cannot deliver. Um, but basically, what, one thing that we learned is that 40% uh, of families in California don't speak English at home. So is using tablets really the most important thing that you could do? So one thing that we discovered in the States, especially in California, was a huge achievement gap between the white and non-white population. And we had quite a substantial portfolio of products and services here in Slovenia, and we decided that we should just adapt one of these systems and not push uh, the tablets as business as such because it would be a hard sell. And one thing that we learned is that it, we wouldn't provide as much value as we would hope to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Rob, uh, what is your um, experience? Um, how long a startup should how much time should a startup take um, um, to, to, to test the product and then to pivot? Is there a certain period of time or um, is this only dependent on the data and feedback from the customer's potential? No, and even that, it's really hard to process the data. You're looking at this, you're like, well, we're not growing, but is that because we didn't execute well enough or is that because no one wants the problem, like it isn't a real problem? Um, or is it, am I bad at sales meetings or do they not want to buy it? There's all these, like, it's really hard to make sense of the data. Um, so for me, I really use advisory boards a lot. Um, ideally, people who have been in my industry or built this type of business model before. And if you reach these points and I just, you, you put the numbers down and you're like, this is what's happening. Like, what would you do if you were in my shoes? Because um, they've seen it before, whereas we're kind of always going through it for the first time. 
So I, I just, yeah, I trust my advisors, my mentors, um, and I, I try to run all of these things by them. And if all of your advisors are like, yeah, you're about to go out of business, I sort of, I'm like, really? Are, are you sure? And they go, yeah, definitely. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then we change what we're doing. Okay. So you don't, you don't have these complex dashboards of all the stuff of analytics and it's, it's numbers a, and everything? It's a tempting idea. I mean, I'm pretty relaxed about all this stuff. And I, I see people and they're like, we have to have a, a hypothesis. And if we don't get 5% of this, then we're going to give up and we failed it. But really, what do they do if they get 4.9%? Like, do, do they hold themselves true to that arbitrary line they drew? Um, so yeah, for me, I, I just trust people who have been there before and, and try to see what feels right, you know? Because so much of it is like, you're happy to ignore the data if it feels right. Um, cool. What's, what's the... Uh, um relationship to these data-driven decisions uh, for the rest of the panel? Do you think that, you know, making, like, instinctive de decisions or depending on a board, like Rob said, is... You, uh, you have to be relying on data, but uh, how you interpret the, those data can vary. But I, I think that you can spot problems from your data. We don't have these, these type of 5% or, or if this isn't that uh, big, then it's wrong. But uh, you can spot, spot the problems from the data. For, for example, in, in terms of pivoting, our retention numbers were kind of really low in the beginning. And uh, we could uh, have some people who like use the product uh, like weekly, but others just used it like in one time in a month or tried it and didn't use it another time. And uh, you, you see this data and you start to investigate what are the causes behind it. And uh, it turned out that the people who completely control their presentation environment are the one who retain, who, who use, use us weekly when they have the whole control of their, their environment. On the other hand, the people who didn't have the, the whole control of their environment, so they are going to other people's workshop to present or, or big events to present, they didn't feel confident that they want to like in, incorporate Soppresso in the making of their presentation. Because if you make your presentation with the interactivity in mind and you can't use a tool like this, it's like if you have to make two versions or prepare two versions of the, the same, for the same time. And uh, this is a, a fear that we had. It was really hard to extract from people because it's not something that they consciously know that uh, this is something that they, it's preventing them for a repeat usage. And that's why we are currently redesigning the user flow. So like most of the the back-end code stays, but, but the front-end and how the user can start a session and what are the needs for that changes based on, on, on these feedbacks we've got from people who are paying us and using uh, mm. us uh, not, not so frequently. Okay. So, so you have to be uh, conscious about your uh, metrics, but uh, you don't have like... Uh, an average uh, retention in the presentation industry. It's something you will never know, and it's something that changes from company to company. Okay. Ivan, um, yeah. Igor? You know, it's not a rocket science. Every, everything has to come naturally. Uh, you have first customers, and they're, they're, then they start, uh, stop being your customers. You have a problem, you start tackling that problem. You know, um, and then you start looking at the data. You, you can't just look at the data and, uh, because you really can't understand the data in the beginning. You know, it really has to come naturally. You're having a problem, you start uh, dealing with it. Otherwise, uh, there are too many problems to actually uh, deal with. And okay. you, in the end, you're dealing with uh, the least important problem instead of uh, seeing the, the, the most important one. And in the beginning, the most important one is only, only one, traction, traction, traction. And this is, again, why you have to go back to your customers and actually spend 100, 150, 1,000% of your time with your customers. You know, because uh, after you talk with hundreds of people, you start uh, seeing like a flashing points of, of one or two problems. They're just popping out. 
you know, uh, we, we lost some customers. We, we came back to them. Some of them yelled uh, at us. And okay, I said, okay, what's the problem? Uh, I look at the metrics. I see, okay, you have a, actually the problem was the price. You know, we were selling for, for um, we weren't selling for, for a high enough price. We were too cheap. But uh, because people wanted to defend this, uh, this price, they wanted to create a situation. You know, so yeah, revenue, 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 and getting back to customers. This is the only metric you have. You you need to have in the beginning. Nothing else. Okay, Ivo. Um, can we ask questions from the audience? Yeah. Can we poll the audience? So, how many people have know who Ross Perot is? Okay, not too many people. So, Ross Perot is essentially the person who invented selling software. Uh, he used to work for IBM in the 60s. He was their top salesman. At the time, IBM was renting out mainframes, essentially, and with the mainframe, you would get a, about 10 or 15 people in white lab coats that came with the mainframe and all the software you needed. So Perot came to IBM management and said, you know, we need to separate this. We'll sell the hardware uh, and we'll sell the software separately. And they said, you're crazy. That'll never work. Go away. Go away. So he left. Uh, he got a bunch of people together. Uh, he gave the company the name EDS, Electronic Data Systems, because that sounded better than IBM. And the first piece of software they created was a gigantic piece of software for IBM mainframes in the 60s to run hospitals. So you could put this in a hospital and the hospital would work better. Um, so they sold it to the 75th hospital they approached. So it took them 74 attempts and the failures and getting rejected by 71, 72, 73, 74, and finally 75th hospital said okay. And then EDS became, in a couple of years, went public, uh, became a giant software company, Ross Pro got very rich, started running for president, da 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 da. And the reason I'm telling this story is that there's another company that I'm sure all of us know much, much better. Uh, so how many people know what Angry Birds is? Okay. Uh, next question, how many people in the audience never answer questions that the panel asks? Okay. So, um, so Angry Birds was, I think, Rovio's either 52nd or 53rd game. Um, the reason I'm saying this is that the issue of pivoting is closely related to the issue of failing. And we all know that the mantra or the myth in the lean startup model, or at least in the startup environment today, is they have to fail fast. You can't be, you know, you can't be banging away at the same thing for too long because it doesn't make sense. It's much better to fail fast and move on to the next thing. Well, these examples, I think, just so just show that yes, it's you know, if it, if it's not working, you know, f admit it. But on the other hand, you may be right, and everybody else might be wrong. Um, so it does sometimes make sense, uh, maybe not to be stubborn, but to be per but to persevere and to be you know, insistent, and if you know that your thing works well, sometimes it's just an issue of you know, finding that 75th customer and then taking off from there. Um, am I recommending that you, you know, do something that's not working forever? No. Uh, what I'm really trying to say is that we have too many, uh, they're nicely called best practices, um, but I think they're basically myths. So somebody asked about you know, attacking the US market, for some companies, that's a great approach. For some companies, attacking the French or the German or the UK or the Russian or the Turkish or the Chinese market might be better. It depends on your project. But one of the myths in our industry, especially in the startup world, is you, know, you have to go to the US. Well, you don't have to go to the US. Uh, great companies have been built in Europe. They've stayed in Europe. And you know, they do business with the US and with many other places. I mentioned SoundCloud. I could mention Nordius or uh, Mendeley as a company and many others. So don't you know, be really careful when you hear wise words from us panelists and you know, take it all with a kilo of salt and you know, eat, your business is your business and you know, you know, be smart about it, be real, get traction and you know, fail fast. Okay, thank you, that was an excellent comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I give another um, comment? So you asked how long should you take before you pivot? Uh, well, it depends on what you understand as a Pivot. I would say that you pivot after each meeting that you have with your customer. If you're wrong, so he's not enthusiastic about your product, you actually pivot. When you don't have to pivot, then you scale. It's as simple as that. So it's not, you know, you have to, you need three months. You don't need three months. 
It could be like one day, but it depends on the definition of pivot. Do you have to target completely different industry to do that, to, to call it a pivot? Or is it slight change? I mean, Rovio stayed in the games business all the time. So were those pivots or were those just different products? Well, I would consider them pivot, but I would consider every change as a pivot. Okay, that's an excellent point, yeah. Again, it's not a rocket science, you know. I, I, sometimes I really get angry because of this startup lingo, you know. Uh, pivot is nothing but uh, you test something and you see if it works and if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you, you put it in, uh, in the trash and start, to, uh, start doing another test. It's all about testing, testing, testing what works, what doesn't work. No, people think it's just that, nothing, nothing else. So, yeah, you have to constantly test. Uh, we are having a fourth or fifth uh, business model change, uh, fifth uh, redesign of user experience, user interface. We are constantly changing everything. Uh, we, we created our landing page. We started our uh, UK, uh, UK uh, AdWords campaign. Uh, it, was, it was a disaster. You, you, we came back, we started learning, you know, it's, everything is about testing, learning, scraping, doing it again and again and again. This is pivoting. Okay, so please don't get angry. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> okay, any other questions from the uh, audience? We are slowly, you know, we have five minutes left. So, um, I, did, I didn't count my questions, but Mark. No, no, just, please. Yeah, okay, uh, two questions. Uh, totally unrelated. Uh, pivoting, is it like an evolutionary process? Like, you know, evolutionary process, as you said, right, Igor? I mean, you know, like evolution works in nature. You, you create a lot of, you know, little different uh, copies and then the one which works best goes in the next round, or is it revolutionary? One question. And second question to Rob is, you know, how do you get your advisors? How do you attract them? Is it like, you know, the fun? Is it, is it your personality? Is it money? And, and money is, of course, important. So, you know, how do you decide how much money you offer to those guys, you know, so that you don't insult them with too little and you don't pay too much? Thanks. I, I can answer the second one pretty quickly. I think the, the first question is harder and you guys can... Uh, you, you guys can work on that. So for advisors, like industry standard, with the understanding that everything changes, it's like if you haven't yet raised funding, it's usually an equity relationship, uh, at least for me, because I want them adding ongoing help for a couple years. So I usually do 1% to 2% if I haven't raised funding yet on a two-year vesting with no cliff, which means they just get their 1% to 2% spread out over two years. Um, if you've already raised funding, it's more like half a percent, maybe 1% if they're really good. Um, and the big pushback I get, like in most cases, I've been really surprised how amazing the people are who are willing to join my advisory board. They're like super senior in the industry, they're, they're great. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. But actually it's quite a flattering offer to be, for a startup who's doing something that you're excited about. They're like, hey, I want you to take a piece of my company. Um, and where advisors get nervous and where, where I see people saying no is if they're worried that it's gonna take too much of their time. So I'm always really clear what I want. And so I'll say, and I usually ask them for two hours a month. I say once a month, I want to meet you for coffee. Um, and one hour a month, I'm sort of expecting that maybe you can look at emails for me or, or make a connection, make an introduction. So to me, I just try to be really clear about, about that. And, and yeah, the, with my first company, they came through my investors. Like we went through an accelerator and the accelerator put us in touch with potential advisors. Um, and then later on now, a lot of them come out of my sales meetings. And I say a lot, I've, you know, it's not like I've had a million companies, but like a couple have come out of sales meetings and a couple have just come out of people that I know in the community who I respect as entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm like, oh, like you're a great entrepreneur. Can you be like the voice of sanity to, to keep me from running into a wall? Cool, and uh, first question, Igor. It should always be evolutionary process because revolution, you know, there is a saying, revolutions always eat their own uh, children. If, if there is a revolution, there is th something fundamentally wrong or you're uh, changing something fundamentally. Because, you know, we started doing uh, cloud software for optimi optimizing uh, business in hotels. And we came to the Google for business context. Uh, it's totally different market. Uh, everything is different. But the way we, we, we approach this and the way we're realizing it right now is it's totally evolutionary. Because ev evolution is a learning process. It's, it's again, testing what works, what doesn't, and, and you it's really evolutionary process. 
I really don't see it as a, as a, as a, as a revolution it, because when you have a revolution there, you really have to know why do you, why do you need a revolution and it's really um, 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 strong, uh, strong word and um, it's kind of a nasilno. Um, violent. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really violent, uh, violent, uh, um, violent event. So the a quick, quick for me, yeah. for me, pivoting is when you change your customer, and until that, it's just another iteration when you want to serve that same customer. So, in, in your case, the pivot was when you went from the hotel hospitality industry for the uh, people who need the business contact. But for us, we're staying in for the, developing for the same. Uh, customer is just another iteration when new new stuff comes up. Okay, Yaka, last comment. Um, I actually agree with you, and I would say that it should be evolutionary. But when you look back and see the change between pilot, pilot number one and the last version, you should see a revolution, or you probably will. But if you start with the revolution way of thinking, you're actually starting a new business rather than piloting. Perfect. That was a great comment for the closing of this uh, round table. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining me uh, up here. Uh, thank you all for your question. One big applause for my audience.